peace be to you. It is fitting that there be something special said to young married couples. There is nothing more beautiful in this world than two young people in love. Now, in order that their love may endure, it is fitting that they recognize some of the great spiritual and psychological differences between them. We will briefly enumerate a few of those and then point out some of the tensions that are to be expected in married life and which can easily be resolved. First of all, as regards the spiritual differences, between a man and a woman, man generally marries to have a woman. A woman generally marries to have a child. Another difference is this. Man looks to the pleasure in marriage. Woman looks to the fruition and the purpose of that pleasure. Thirdly, man gives reasons for loving a woman. He will say, I love you because you are beautiful. I love you because you are good and virtuous. A woman never gives reasons. She gives herself. Surrender is its own reason for love. Another difference Man is quicker to love than a woman. He is quicker to love because he can love an aspect or a part or an experience with a woman. But a woman is slower to love. She will not love until she can give herself totally and completely. That means that she has to wait longer in order that she might discover all of the inspirations there are for her great act of self-oblation. And another difference. A man is afraid of dying before he has lived. A woman is generally afraid of dying before she has begotten life. Now these differences, once they are understood, can be used to help reconcile any difficulties that may appear. And the difficulties are called tensions, and we are going to enumerate five of them. Tensions that are to be expected in every marriage, not because of a defect, in the persons, but simply because these tensions are just part of our fallen human nature. The first tension is this, between wanting and not wanting love. You really never know one another until you are married. Courtship is a kind of a masked ball. And in marriage, we take off the masks and we see ourselves as we really are. As the poet has put it, Yes, I answered you last night. No, I say to you today. Colors seen by candlelight do not look the same by day. There can be a change. The human heart can reach a point where it has too much love and wishes to be loved no longer. Remember the poem of Francis Thompson? He told how he picked up a child to hold and how the child resisted and cried and kicked to get down. And on reflecting, he wondered if that's not the way some souls are before God. They are not ready to be loved by him. 
and so too in the human order, there comes a tug every now and then between wanting love and not wanting it. What is the mysterious chemistry inside of the human heart which makes it swing between a feeling that it is not loved enough and a feeling at times that it is loved too much? Torn between longing and satiety, craving, disgust, desire, satisfaction, the human heart asks, why should I be that way? When satiety comes, the thou disappears in the sense that it is no longer wanted. When longing reappears, the thou becomes a necessity. Love too much, there is discontent. Love too little, there is emptiness. Now this is what you are going to feel, but do not be cynical about it. There is a reason why you are this way. And the reason is this. You were made for the great sacred heart of love, and no one but God can satisfy you. Your heart is right in wanting the infinite, but your heart is wrong in trying to make its finite companion the substitute for the infinite. The solution of this tension is in seeing that the disappointments which it brings are just so many reminders that love is God's love on pilgrimage. Both the being loved too much and the being loved too little can go together when seen in the light of God. When this longing for infinite love is envisaged as a yearning for God, then the finiteness of our earthly love reminds us of the words of St. Augustine. Our hearts were made for thee, O Lord. And they are restless until they rest in thee. Just keep in mind this fact. In every marriage, man promises a woman something that only God can give. And in every marriage, Every woman promises a man something that only God can give. And that is the reason of the pull between the too little and the too much. The too little because we want God. The too much because the human cannot completely satisfy. Now there's another tension that you will feel, and this is very basic to human nature. The tension between wanting to be one with another person, and at the same time feeling so alone, almost alone together. There will come moments when Yourself is lost in another. And then afterwards, a terrific sense of being thrown backwards on your own solitary personality. Why is this? The reason is because there's nothing material or fleshy or carnal in the world that can unite. You just try making two blocks of marble one. Why can't you unite them? Because they are material. The flesh alone, and here I emphasize alone, the flesh alone cannot unite. Only the soul, the spirit can unite. 
For example, if we learn together the Our Father, my knowledge of the Our Father does not deprive you from learning it. And if we pray together, we are much more one than we could be in any material fashion. It is the spirit that unites. And therefore, the flesh is the means to unity. You see, it's not an obstacle to unity. Your flesh is a means to unity because it is bound up with the soul. And to the extent that love loses its soul, it loses its unity and its sense of oneness. When the spirit is gone, there's left only body proximity with boredom and fatigue. Now, this passion for a crescendo of intimacy until oneness it is, is achieved cannot be completely satisfied in the physical order because after the act of unity, there remains the status of two distinct personalities, each with his own individual mystery. You see the paradox? Souls of lovers aspire to unity. But the body alone, though it is the momentary symbol of that unity, is of and by itself exclusive of unity. The flesh is impervious to that kind of unity which alone can satisfy the spirit. Now, there's no marriage in the world that is free from this tension. And the tension increases, too as the body will go through the motions of love without the soul. And you will find that the tension of the body decreases as the soul loves. There is an escape, therefore, from this tension. We are not to be cynical about it. And the greatest relief of this tension is the begetting of children. For here, this seeming disproportion that is felt between a passion for unity on the one hand and the failure to make it permanent on the, on the other is compensated for by the child because the child becomes the new bond of unity outside of father and mother. Husband and wife will never feel the emptiness of their relations one with another when their relations are filled up with a new body and soul. Soul directly infused by God the Creator. God made man right. And man is unhappy if he tries to frustrate these laws. The children, therefore, are the answer to the paradox of the aloneness together. They are the link that binds the lovers together, body and soul. That brings us to the third tension. It is a tension between the unending ecstasy of love, which is dreamed about, and the way love actually turns out in marriage. There are some who become cynical about it, which one should not. If one starts with the assumption that the other person is God, well, then one is doomed to drink the bitter dregs of disappointment. We must not, therefore, attribute too much to the other party. If we do, we are going to feel let down. Because the other partner did not give all he promised to give, which he's incapable of giving. Only God can give it, as we said. To repeat, because the other party did not give all that he promised to give, sometimes the other feels betrayed and deceived and disappointed and cheated. In other words, I entered this marriage to be supreme and infinitely happy, and you're not making me happy. For the reason that 
kind of discontent comes over the soul is because one expected something from marriage that is not there. Here is the answer to that problem. Remember that no human being in the world is love. God alone is love. We creatures are just lovable, and only to a limited degree. When the creature begins to take the place of the Creator and is made to stand for love, then marriage turns to hate. When marriage is expecting a God, for the woman to be a kind of an angel, she turns out to be a fallen angel. The man turns out to have feet of clay. When the ecstasy stops and the band no longer plays and the champagne of life loses its sparkle, then there are some who will call the other partner a cheater and a robber. Then they go to a divorce court and they say, we're not compatible. We want a divorce because we are incompatible. Was there ever in all the world a perfectly compatible marriage? No two people in all the world are compatible, absolutely. Then they begin looking for a new partner. And they go through the same mistake, expecting another wife or another husband to give that which only God can give. They enter into a new marriage. They do not find happiness. Why not? Because they're only adding zeros. The reason that marriage failed was because they refused to see married love as the vestibule to the divine. It is vain to think that another love can supply what the first love lacked. Cows can graze on other pastures, but there's no substitute for a person to whom one has committed his whole being for life. Remember then, you are not to expect too much. What you want is in heaven, not here on earth. Your partner is a fraction. God alone is the whole. Do not expect, therefore, the other partner to give you infinite happiness. There is a heaven but it is not here on earth. The fourth tension is the tension between sex and love. Now, when we speak of this tension, it must not be assumed that the two are opposites. They are not. When we speak of them here separately, it is because we are referring to those who separate sex from love. In married life, the two are to be united. Sex is the highest expression of the love between husband and wife. But when the two are not correctly understood, or when they are divorced, then we find these differences. Sex seeks the part, love the totality. Sex is biological and has its very definite zones of satisfaction, and love, on the contrary, includes all of these, but is directed to the totality of the person loved, the totality, namely the person made of body and soul and created to the image and likeness of God. Love sees the clock and its purpose. Sex concentrates on the mainspring and forgets that it was made to keep time. An organ does not include the personality, but the personality includes the organ, which is another way of saying Love includes sex, but sex does not necessarily include love. 
Love concentrates on the object. Sex on the subject, namely on the self. Love is directed to someone else for the sake of the other's perfection. Sex is directed to self for the sake of self-satisfaction. Sex flatters the object, not because it is praiseworthy in itself, but rather as a solicitation. It knows how to make friends and to influence people. The ego in sex pleads that it loves the, the other person. But what it really loves is the projection of the ego and the self into the other person. And that is quite a different thing. Sex is moved by a desire to fill a moment between having and not having. It is an experience like looking at a sunset or twirling one's thumbs to pass the time. And it rests after an experience, being glutted for the moment, and then waits for reappearance of the new passion to be satisfied on an entirely different object sometimes. Now love frowns on this notion. For it sees in this nothing but the killing of the objects loved for the sake of self-satisfaction. Sex would give birds flight but no nests. It would give hearts emotions but no homes. It would throw the whole world into the experience of voyagers at sea, but with no ports. Instead of purifying an infinite which is fixed, namely God, it substitutes the false infinite and never finds satisfaction. And one of the reasons why so many suffer from psychosis, neurosis, is because they're in a fruitless and constant search for the infinite in the finite, for God in carnality. How different is real love? Real love admits the need, the thirst, the passion, the craving, but it also admits a real adhesion to a value that transcends all space and all time. In love, poverty becomes integrated to riches. In real love, the need becomes the fulfillment, and the yearning becomes a joy. But sex is without that joy of often. The wolf offers nothing when it kills the lamb because the joy of oblation is missing. Sex receives so as not to give. But love is sole contact with another for the sake of perfection. And to sum it all up, you will feel a tension, therefore, between the Romance and the marriage between the chase and the capture. Is there any way of ever combining to the two? To have always the thrill of the romance and always the thrill of the capture. Yes, there is. But not in this world. The only real answer to this paradox of the chase and the capture is to be found in eternity. When your love leads you back to God, then you will capture something so infinitely ecstatic that it will take an eternity of chase to discover its meaning. Understand that. You will know that as husband and wife, all the love that you have is just a spark, which is to lead you up to the flame, which is God. And your marriage will become like a tuning fork to the song of the angels. 
It will be like a river that runs into the sea, where the romance and the marriage fuse into one. For since God is boundless eternal love, it will take that eternal chase to sound its depths. At one and the same moment, there will be in heaven a limitless receptivity and a boundless gift. This is what you marry for. For love. And love leads you to God. God love.